exactly a month ago today, we shot a market crash video. And at the time, I knew the market was not in good shape. But the last 30 days, based on a lot of research and a lot of data that we've looked at, which I'm gonna share with you, as bad as I thought it was, it's a lot worse. Now, you get to do whatever you wanna do with this data. Dave Ramsey calls it fear porn, saying there's a lot of people getting scared and they're excited about the markets. Nothing's gonna happen to the market. It's gonna be all right because the inventory's not taking a hit. I'll give you data. You read the data, free PDF, choose whatever you want, to do, you want to do with it, then make a decision for yourself. Because when you look at $3 trillion of wealth being lost in retirement in the first six months, a trillion in crypto, and you know that domino effect, because the question becomes, is it too late? Can we do anything about it? When people stop making money and their wealth goes away, they have less disposable income. When you have less disposable income, there's less spending. When there's less spending, there's lower business profits. Lower business profits leads to layoffs. Then it's unemployment, then it's foreclosures and bankruptcies, then divorce, crime, drugs, OD, alcohol, protests, riots, back at it again. Sounds scary. So that's uh, pretty dramatic from Mr. Patrick Bet David. And so... I want to I want to break this video down. I mean, yeah. so many people have been sending this to me because you and I, the position that we're taking is that a housing market crash is in fact not coming. And what I want to do is take this video. We're going to go through some of the key points that he's making and give some data yeah. that provides a counter argument to some of the points that he made in the video. And the thing is, Steve, I want to make this very clear. I'm a huge, I am a huge Patrick but David fan. I've got yeah. his book out out in our our lobby of our of our studio. I've been a huge fan for a while. But here's the thing: I am so shocked that his team let him put this video out. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's 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 dramatic, right? And and I think that you know part of part of what he's so good at is he's a marketer right but just the just some of the data in the video to me it doesn't i mean there's like all this talk of research and this and that but so that that's the thing with research and data you know and, and i always explain it to you and, and it's like my common theme as i when i watch these is like the brown rice versus white rice you know right. like how bad is white rice for me or like how gross does brown rice taste you yeah. know and like you can do all the research you want and one part, like everybody will say white rice is great. And everybody, you know, there's another 50% that say white rice is bad, you know? And for me, when I see something like that with the dark, the dramatic and the black and, and the, the music closures and unemployment, and it's, and it's, it starts out, it's almost a contradictive from the beginning when he's like, you know, $3 trillion in assets lost, disposable income is gone. Well, it's like, even those are two different things, yeah. you know, when really, and, and we'll get into it, but wage growth is up. Yeah. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. And, and that's, you're exactly right. The point he's trying to make in the video is specifically comparing the 2022, 2023 housing market to that of 2008. Yeah. The whole, the, the, the title of the video is housing crash. Is this 2008 all over again? And so when I saw the video, when, when somebody sent it to me, I'm like, okay, well, let's see kind of what data, you know, that they have to support a video like this. And the thing I was most shocked, and we're going to break down, I think, what do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, five, or six points in the video. The thing I was most shocked about, not one point had to do necessarily with the housing market crash. Right. Like if you're going to, if you're going to make the argument and make a huge claim that the 2022-2023 housing market crash is going to be worse than that of 2008, a guy as well-researched as he is, like right. with all his content, you would think that him or his team would come to the video with some arguments that were in context. Everything right. he talked about, I was just, I was blown away. The yeah. things he's talking about, I'm like, wait, when are you going to talk about the housing market? And right. that you have evidence to support a crash. When is that coming in the video? Yeah. It never came. Other than at the end, when he mentioned the the foreclosures were up 700%, which we came off, we just came well, off of like an unprecedented foreclosure freeze. Let's get into right. it. Yeah, yeah, all right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting all excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that's so yeah. funny. So let's go one right. point at a time, right? Yep. So let's start off with point number one. So he starts off talking about housing affordability. So let me, I'm going to share my screen again, and let's listen to what he has to say about this, and then we will talk this through. 
If you bought a half a million dollar house, let's just say your loan is $500,000 and you bought it two years ago and you got a nice 3% rate, your payment would be roughly $2,108. Now, if you buy a house, which roughly today, the rates are on 6%, the same $500,000 loan at 6% is $2,997. That's nearly $900 higher. Now, if you were to buy the same $500,000 loan at 9%, watch what happens here. The payment becomes $4,023. It doubles in payment from 3%. Same loan amount, same house, everything's the same. One was 3%, it was $2,100 a month. The other one is 9%, it's $4,000 a month. How many Americans can go from $2,100 a month to $4,000 a month? Not many. All right, so I don't have necessarily a huge issue with this part of the video outside yeah. of what he's talking about is the housing affordability, which yeah. we know as interest rates go up, I mean, anybody can do the math and say, okay, the, mo the monthly mortgage payment is going to be more expensive as the mortgage interest rates go up. Here's right. the thing. We got a whole segment on interest rates. So I don't want to get into yeah. that piece of him saying 9%. We're going to talk all about that in a second. What I want to focus on right now is housing affordability and break some things down to give people some context, all right? So I've got some math in our notes and then I wanna kinda go through this in great detail. So he gives the example of $500,000 at 3% mortgage payment 2108, fine. The math checks out on any right. mortgage calculator online. Yep. Well, rates aren't 9%. As we're making this video, right. they're 7%. So, right. so let's yep. give a real example. Yep. That mortgage payment, $500,000 loan at 7% would be $3,326, which is $1,200 difference. I'm it's not a ton taking, of money. It's a ton of money. Not taking anything away from that. 14 Absolutely grand a year. Absolutely not. Yep. But the thing that he failed to include, like he did throughout the entire video, was context. So in order to, here's the thing, you do this for a living. In order right. to qualify for a $500,000 loan, somebody would have to be making somewhere around $9,000 a month. Right. And that's in 2021. Now, as wages have gone up, what, eight, eight and a half percent? Yep. Their new income now would be $9,720 per month, not 9,000. Right. So there's a $720 diff, right? Right, yep. And so if we look at that and we say, okay, well, the real, the real difference here is not 1,200. Because the increase in income was 480, so the real difference is only $480 a month. Right. And an interest rate from three all the way up to seven. Now, right. I'm not taking that away. That's a lot of money. Right. But the question that I have is someone who's buying a $500,000 home, some will say I'm not going to buy it because it's $500 more a month than I had planned for. Right. And some might say, well, no, this is the house of my dreams. I'm moving. I'm right. not moving just because of interest rates. Most people don't, by the way. Right. Most people don't make a decision to buy or sell a house or to move based on what the interest rates are. They do it. Why? Because of a life event. Right. And most of my clients, most of your clients, for 400 and whatever dollars, $480 difference, because interest rates are at 7%, not 3%, most of the time, matter of fact, so much so, we there was, I don't know, 468,000 people that bought a house last month? Right. The, I mean, that's the thing. The market's still moving, and, and people, like, it, it's such a, and, and, and Patrick, but, da, but David, and the availability of all that data that, that we have out there is, is what people are, are using as they start to justify, yes, payments are higher. We have to think that the home buyer today, you look at like household incomes and things like that and their income seventy thousand dollars. Like the 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 current home buyer, that that's not like the primary person in this market right now with where prices are at that are sustaining the market. Income and for a household that I see is much higher than that. That would be in a lot of cases, I might be I might be using a lower income number to qualify for a loan to get, you know, like a special deal on on some sort of like income driven loan. But as you said, the $480 a month difference after you look at wage growth and things like that, for a lot of people to make the move, their understanding of that, they take that into account. And they also know they're looking back and they're consuming all this content. They're saying, I can refinance. Like we know that, I mean, interest rates are the easiest 
uh, what do you call, what are those things called? The uh, puppets? Like yeah. that's the easiest like puppet string that sure. the Fed can pull is, right. is changing interest rates and affordability in housing. Yeah. And we're, and we're going to break that down in great detail, but I want to, yeah. I want to give everybody, I want to give everybody some context really quick around what, like, because here's the thing, a video with this type of claim, I think you got to show a lot of data or now yeah. he brings up some data, yeah. but he leaves so much context out. So if you look at the screen right now, 400, just under 469,000 people bought a house last month. Yeah. Okay. That's with interest rates at 7%. Yeah. Now, okay, cool. That's down 23%. Major headlines, major, major media, the housing market's falling apart. Wait a minute. Let's look at the data. If you look at the other lines, okay, yeah, it's down from what? 2021, when the housing market was the hottest it's ever been in the history right. of the earth. What about 2017, 2018? 2019, when mortgage interest markets. rates, all great markets, were interest rates at 7%? No. No, they were not. And look, we still, at 7%, more people bought a house last month at 7% interest rates, although, yes, it's still more expensive. Yes, demand is down. No, I'm not arguing that point. The point I want to argue, before we move on to the next point, is from those markets of 17, 18, 19, if you look at the graph, it is still up from those markets right. when there were lower interest rates right, and nobody was talking about housing crash back then. So right. context matters. I, I agree hundred percent. Your thoughts on that? I mean, it's an act, it's a, there's, it's a big change in activity from where we're at. It's not necessarily a change in value. Right. That's, that's the part that you just, you have to keep in mind is that yes, things have slowed down tremendously, you know, especially in, in, if you look at like mortgage applications and purchase transactions, They've slowed down tremendously, but the values of the transactions aren't changing with consistently with the, that narrative of a housing crash. Yeah. And so the next part of the video, this is where this is the first part of the video where I started to get, I don't know, maybe frustrated, I would call it. Yeah. Um, where he talks about interest rates. So now we're yeah. going to really take some time, but take a listen to this. So now some people in the real estate world, you may be watching the same Pat, give me a break. It's not going to go to 9%. It's not going to go to 12%. It's not going to go to 15%. Okay, fair. Maybe you're right. But Musk said prepare and I'm advising you to be prepared so you can persevere. So let's say what if it goes to 9%? I think it's going to go to 10%. I think it may even go higher than 10%, but I think it's going to touch 10%. Let's All right. So that is, I mean, that's a huge, huge massive um assumption yeah w without really you know any data to support why you would believe interest rates would go to 10 percent right. in the video he talks about well let's go back and let's look at you know uh, uh mortgage rates over the past 30 40 50 years and right. so we'll, let's let's do that for a second before we unpack this if we look at, this is what he shows in his video, by the way. Yeah. So he says, okay, well, look at interest rates. If you go back all this time, it's very rare that interest rates are under 5%. Okay, I'm not arguing that. But what he, what he fails to show, you see these little gray little bars. You and I both know what those are. But for the viewer that's watching this, these are all recessions. Recessions, yep. And what we're going to talk about a lot is every time there's a recession, what do rates do? They go down. Recession rates down, recession rates down, recession rates down, recession rates down, re recession. This is the pandemic or no, I'm sorry. That's the great recession down. Then the pandemic rates down. Well, right. we all believe that we are what we are heading into a recession. I don't think anybody would argue the fact that we're going into a recession. And we just showed on the same graph that he showed in his video that anytime we go into recession, what do rates do? They go down every time. They go down every time. And so the thing I think we have to look at is what drives mortgage interest rates. Now, we know that inflation is mortgage rates follow inflation. Right. So let's pull up another industry expert who talks about this fact. And then we'll kind of look into this and unpack this. But this chart that we'll share right now, I believe will help us to see and interpret um, where we can expect things to go in the very near term. So as we look right now at this report, and I'm going to, I'm gonna just quickly go right 
right to it here, we can take a quick peek and we can see that the, individual, the report of 6.3% year over year, which is what we're running, is truly made up of 12 individual months or 12 individual monthly components. So the reason why the bond market had an awful go in September is because the second week of September, we got that August number and the August number was up six tenths of a percent. It replaced August of 2021 because you only have 12 months. So as the new data comes in, it replaces now the 13 month old data. So this change of up two tenths of a percent being replaced by up six tenths, that made the market just puke as we went on a year over year basis from 5.9% year over year inflation on the core CPI to 6.3. And of course, inflation because it erodes the buying power that you receive on your fixed payment as the recipient of that bond, it erodes it more rapidly. So the only way to get compensated for that is to charge a higher rate so you can offset the more rapid rate of erosion due to higher inflation. Well, as people are listening to this, we will have now received the report for September of 2022, which will replace September 2023. Now we've got this rounded at three tenths of a percent, but you can see here's the three tenths of the line. It's really like 0.26. So the reason why that this was expected to be a turbulent time and we didn't think inflation would peak was because as the new numbers came out, they would repla be replacing numbers that were set at a low bar. So easy to exceed these numbers and potentially easy to see this number go up. Now, I don't know what this number is going to be released is going to be, but the chances of it being greater than 0.26 for the month of September of 2022 are probably greater than them being a lower number. So that's why we see a little bit of heartburn in this particular time frame. However, here's the good news. Starting with the October 22 report, which we'll be receiving November 10th, can't wait. That is going to begin no a kidding. string of reports it. that will be replacing much higher numbers here, as you could see. As we go into the fourth quarter of 2022, we were replacing fourth quarter of 2021. And even in the first half of 2023, as we replace these 2022 numbers, which are higher readings, we have a really good chance to see inflation decline and decline by a significant amount. And as that happens, so that's really interesting, right? So right. if keep keep that up for a second, yeah, if yeah. you if you look on that, so just just to speak, so so as he mentioned, we during this time we did not get this September this September number, so that did that did come back. So that was 0.26, and the core rate of inflation, which he's looking at here, the consumer price, yeah. the core consumer price index, it went up by 0.3. Right. Right. So that really disrupted the market. I mean, we have been in just a massive sell off since that. And it's gone from rates in the high sixes to some days it's like seven and a half. Some days it's seven. And, and so it's just been a really volatile, massive sell off. But to Barry's point, if if you think about it, so so we're going to have another 30 days for the Fed's actions to take hold. Right. Before yep. we get that November 10th reading. And so, and, and if we got inflation to say, so it, it's been gradually coming down. It's higher than what's happening in the summer, which is ugly, and it's yep. making the markets puke, as Barry said. But if we, the, the number we just got that, that he didn't have by the time he released this was 0.3%. So if you look at that at October, we'd have gone down 0.3%. So that's already showing some of that easing in inflation. And a lot of people say like, well, yeah, but this November one, a number you can get rid of that if you want but the november inflation report that we're going to get like look steve gas prices are back up they're up like 30 percent again and we're doing you know food prices are up because now you know farmers are getting this last summer of crops out fertilizer is very expensive and all these different treatments and, and that's why they use that core inflation number so that strips out the price of food and it strips out the price of oil uh, mainly because the fed can't control it right yeah so can bad crops opec whatever it might be they, they can't control those. So that's why we look at that core number. And they're hoping that that core number um, is is at least the same as it was within this last reading, would show a 0.3% decrease. And I mean, you start to look at some like retail sales figures and um, some different like freight and logistics numbers, you're seeing like freight and logistics companies are showing less revenues right now, which is saying like, hey, we're being called on to ship less, less stuff. Yeah. It's like a leading indicator of a of Absolutely. A well, I think it's important at this time in the video that we we consider 
helping the audience understand our eyewitness, if you will, Mr. Barry Habib, take a second and help people understand who he is, what his company does, so the audience can, maybe we can offer some credibility to yeah. the source. Because Patrick says in the video many, many times, I'm not in the business, I'm not in the yeah. industry. He's a talking head selling advertising and YouTube clicks. And so right. uh, who is Barry Habib? So he's so he owns a company uh, MBS Highway, which is MBS stands for Mortgage Backed Security, and that's that's the instrument mortgages are sold on in the secondary market, right? That's like the bond, the mortgage bonds that we talk about. So he's he's an analyst for that, and then he's one of his partners in the company. Also, is actively trading in the mortgage backed security market. So they do, I mean, they're highly vested in these transactions, managing these markets, and they manage you know investment portfolios and things like that, and so. Um, Barry, one of the things he does every year is he goes, he does a prediction. He's like, here's my crystal ball, you know, and, and what he'll do is he'll show the previous year's prediction and he'll versus show actuals. the versus what actually happened. And I mean, the guy's really, really smart, but the, the thing about him that, that I think is, is where he's really a step above is how simple he makes it. You right. know, he made all of his, all of his daily updates and like any kind of marketing or I've done some like um, private zoom, like I pay for his services. So I have some access to like some zoom calls and stuff. And he makes it so easy to understand. And it's always got like that simple chart. Like I yeah. was like, it, it really makes you see the light with some of that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know? I think, yeah. And I agree. And I think the point is though, that he is a trusted resource inside yeah. of the industry yeah. that major institutions go to for insight in the financial markets. Yeah. So it's not like we just grab some random YouTube video to show the audience as the arguments, the counter arguments that we're making to Patrick's video. I think right. it's important for us to understand that. So the question then is this, if we believe that inflation is, is going to go down in order for, for, so inflation right now as we're making this video is 8.2%. Yes. Okay? Yep. The question then is if mortgage interest rates follow inflation, which we already shown for the last 50 years, that is exactly what has happened. There's never yeah. been a time where they haven't. So it, I believe it's safe to assume that that will continue on yep. because mortgage uh, inflation drives mortgage rates, right? right? I don't think, I hope nobody would debate that. Right. So the question, it's simple investment math. Yeah, right? exactly like he, right. Then he was talking about that, like where, you know, the rate of inflation is eroding bond returns. And so that's what you're buying 10-year treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. That's a bond that you're buying. So if you lock in a rate on that bond, a fixed rate bond, and you're not getting it till the end of the year. And in the meantime, you've been able to buy 8% less stuff on your grocery list. You have to spend 8% more to purchase your grocery list. You're losing on that bond. Yeah. So as inflation goes down, it's just, it's a function of the markets. It's not an emotional thing. It's not fed people looking for, you know, uh, notoriety or anything like that. It's, it's, uh, it's a function of the market. Yeah. And I think that the important part about this video and the breakdown in this video and the counter argument that we're making right now is we're still on point two that PBD makes, which is he believes interest rates are gonna to go to 10, 11, 12%. In order for that to happen, that inflation must also go up. Yeah. You agree? Exactly. In order for mortgage interest rates to go up from here, from this point where we're at right now, making this video right now, inflation must increase. We right. just heard Barry Abib say that uh, the October number that comes out or the October inflation report that's going to come out based on the November 2nd report suggests that inflation is going to do what? Go down. Go down. Year over year should be down. Year over year should be down. Right. Well, if if Barry Habib wasn't enough, maybe we listen to the Fed chair himself to see what he says about timing with inflation coming down. So let's listen to this. In the SEP for total PCE inflation is 5.4% this year and falls to 2.8% next year, 2.3% in 2024, and 2% 2 in 2025. So we just heard Jerome Powell himself say, when he says this year, this that was the last Fed meeting, he's talking about yeah. 2022, yeah. that inflation, in fact, has peaked. Yep. That's what he's suggesting. He's suggesting that inflation is not gonna go up from here that it's right. gonna do nothing but go down to the goal rate of 2%. So in, the only way Patrick could be right with his 10% or 9% and all these different things he's talking about is if inflation's gonna go up. There's right. no data to suggest inflation's going up. 
there's all the data to support that inflation is going down, which right. supports the idea that mortgage interest rates will follow and go down from this point, not up. Right. Your thoughts? I'm really praying for that, actually, yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that, that's true. The, the, it's very simple. And in, in the Fed, I mean, the, the problem with the Fed is, is it's, uh, again, because of some of the messaging they put out in the past. Like, there's the uh, Loretta Mester, I think, is yep. the one. Where she said, I mean, up until like April of this year that she's like, we need uh, high inflation or that we need sustained inflation to get the economy back on track. Meanwhile, the Fed chair is like, inflation is going up, like we're going to have to start doing something. And then in the actions that they're taking and in something that we should think about, too, is is we're looking back, basing that on um, like the, the 80s, I believe, when rates were went from like 12 percent to 18 yeah. percent. So they went up six percent which is pretty much where we're at now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're at like, we're up, rates are up about 5% right now. Um, if you look at, if even if you look at from 3% to 9%, that's 6%, that, that would be the largest increase ever. And we would exceed that massive increase from the 80s uh, drawn by inflation. And, and the one thing that the Fed didn't have then was a lot of this quantitative easing and right. some of these, these tools that they have. They were only raising the rate to fight inflation at that point. So they were really going through this demand destruction at that time, which was it, it was just a different environment. Yeah. You know? So w what I want to do is I want to compare Patrick Bet David's mortgage rate forecast, right? And again, he says it. I'm not in the industry. Yeah. I want to compare that to industry expert mortgage forecast. So nobody better to start off with than Mr. Barry Habib. Let's see what he sure. has to say about mortgage interest rates in the future. He asked, uh, answered indirectly one of the questions with rates. He said, hey, they're probably gonna be maybe in the fives in Q1 or Q2. Guys, you're asking us, hey. And I, th I think under five. I think under five, which. Under five. Um, as we get late this year, early next year, it depends a lot on the, the inflation numbers and it depends on those unforeseen events, right? So that's one expert who believes that interest rates are going to come back down from 7% and come closer to 5 He even said even may, they might even go less than 5 So yeah. that's, that's one expert's opinion. Let's look at some more. So on the screen right now, you're looking at... I mean, some what I would call credible sources. We have Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, NBA, and NAR. Let's look at what they believe mortgage interest rates are, are going to look like. So Q4 2022, Freddie Mac says 5.4%. Fannie Mae says 4.8%. MBA, the Mortgage uh, uh, Banker Association, says 5.2%. NAR says 6%. The average is 5.4%. 2022. Right. So we have Patrick Bet David says they're going to go to 9%. All of these organization says 5.4 what about 2023 if you look at the screen 5352 and by the by Q3 of 2023 down to 4.8 percent so these aren't people's um these aren't talking head YouTube people you know th right. this is what these industry experts do right w what are your thoughts on on mortgage rate projections I I agree I mean these these projections are great and and Maybe they do seem a little bit low, but maybe not. Maybe even if they're a quarter above that, or even if they're six percent, is such a drastic uh, mental barrier, you know? Because rates, it's people. I'm like, hey, your rate's going to be seven and a quarter. What's it take me to get six point eight seven five? Or right. I had somebody call me yesterday, like, hey, you got that six point seven five still? Yeah, you yeah. know? I'm like, yeah. I was like, we can. Like, we have to price it out and like there's some different things that we have to do. But you have to understand, like the companies that are giving those projections, so you have like. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are responsible for trillions of dollars, right? right? And those, like, when a loan is sold in the secondary market, you'll, like, most people do a mortgage, right? You go through your mortgage, you have a closing with me, maybe your title company bakes fresh baked cookies. Right. I don't know. They did that yesterday, smashed them. Yeah. Um, but you go home and you get, like, a welcome to your mortgage email, and this is how you set up your online thing. And about three weeks later, it, usually three to four weeks when I start getting the calls, like, hey, my loan got bought by some Fannie Mae. Like, right, what's right. that? Like, do I still make my payment? Is it changing? And like, what's this all about? So Fannie Mae is buying these mortgages. And, and when a, like a loan company, so maybe you have, you know, ABC Local Bank and you make your payments to them. Well, that ABC Local Bank may only be making a quarter to three eighths to a small percentage of that loan. They're getting like, they basically have what they, you call the servicing rights. And you have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these G, they're like government sponsored entities. 
that actually service that. And that's where the majority of your interest is going that you're paying on those loans. So those companies, when you're managing that much money, you have to be dialed in. Like these aren't just pie in the yeah. sky numbers. I mean, these are you're, government you're, sponsored things that have access to all the data. You know? Yeah, your point is you put a lot more weight into the forecast from those organizations than a, a YouTuber that's not even yeah. in the industry. Right. And, and when I say that, I, I almost feel bad because I'm such a fan of, of Patrick Bet Davids. But he's yeah. not, he's not a, he's not a, um, he's in the insurance industry, right? right? And so he's not a Fannie Mae, he's not a Freddie Mac. And so, yeah, I'm going to take their, their forecast. I'm going to take the weight of that much greater than Patrick's, right? right. So I, I think, go ahead. and I don't mean to cut you off, but I, it, you know, knowing that he's in the insurance business, and again, it goes back to like not bashing somebody like, the, the video is about preparing, right? Yeah. And so when you're in the insurance world, like you never meet an insurance guy that's like, let's go on the, like, let's hope on the high side that it only costs 250 grand to replace your house, not 400, 000. you know what I yeah. mean? Like they yeah. want it, like that's, if it's a preparing video, like I, I understand, again, I understand where he's coming from with like, let's prepare, prepare, persevere and whatever, and be in a good position going into those markets. But to, the, the only part that with this video that I disagree with is saying, it's backed by data, but there's no data back. You just took the words out of my mouth. I'm fine with it if there's data to support the argument. Right. But what if you just come out with, you're just, you just, you're, you, what do you just feel interest rates are going to go up? Like based on what? Right. Every single economic analyst disagrees with you. Right. They all think that rates are going to go down. You think they're going to go up. Why? Right. It would have been great for me to see, okay, what, what, what are you supporting that massive claim that's putting so much fear. I mean, you got a million people who watch this video. Yeah. I mean, sure. you have a lot of influence yeah. in, in, in the, you know, online. And I think it's very irresponsible for people to just come up with claims without any type of data. Right. And so when I look at the data and you have Fannie and Freddie, the people who back, I don't know what percentage of these mortgages being written, the vast I don't want to say the stat, but it's a big one. It's a you know? huge one. Yeah. Who say the exact opposite of what he's saying, that that's where I get really frustrated. So now let's move on to home prices. Yep. So let's listen to first off what Patrick says about prices, and then we can we'll, we'll break this down and talk further. Five years from right now at nine percent, which means value of property could drop 30, 40, 50 percent in certain areas. Okay, so another massive, massive claim. 30, 40, 50% home price drops. I mean, that's probably where, where um, for me, I really kind of lost it a little bit, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, there's one coming up that's even worse than that. But right now, I'm, I'm like, what are you talking about? I made another video on my YouTube uh, channel a couple weeks ago about Graham Stephan. He said the same thing. He took right. some article way out of context right and i said okay well that's patrick's opinion what are the professionals saying well let's look at some of the um the industries the industry standard right right which is let's look at let me just core logic yeah yeah so let's look at core logic first here's their forecast okay so the core logic forecast indicates that home prices will increase month over month by zero percent from august 22 to September 22, okay, so no increase, fine. And on a year over year basis, increase by 3.2% from August 22 to August 23, wait a minute. You have CoreLogic, who is one of the industry standards when it comes to economic uh, forecast or, or an, uh, analysis saying, well, next year home prices are actually gonna go up, wait a minute. Right. But David's saying they're going to go down by 50%. How can that be? Well, let's look at some other companies. Let's look at some, let's see, one, two, three, four, five other major, major, um, we'll call them players in the industry, right. right? So the NBA says home prices in 2023 are going to go up by 2.8%. HPS says up 2.6%. NAR says up 1.2%. Fannie Mae says down not 50%, right. Steve. What is it? One, One and a half percent. The average of all five forecasts was property appreciation in 2023 by 0.2%. Now, again, 
I go back to Patrick here and say, okay, dude, you have so much influence. Right. You have this huge and data. video and data, right? You got the same yeah. data I have access to. This is right. where I'm like, dude, Patrick, your team kind of let you down here. You're saying things like 10%, no, no data to support that. You're saying prices are going to drop 40, 50%. Well, not based on what, what Moody thinks, not based on what Case Schiller thinks, not, right. not based on what CoreLogic thinks. And so, I don't know, I, I get excited when I'm like, you got a YouTuber's opinion and then you got CoreLogic, who you yeah, got to trust. Right. And in a lot of that, it goes back to uh, 2008, right? And and I don't, if you go, there's just, being in the mortgage industry, there's just, and active, right? Like on Main Street, like I'm in the streets. I love that. I'm crying when I yeah. see rate sheets. Like I'm emotional, I'm all that, right? But there's there's so many different factors, you know, and, and um, like whether it be exotic mortgages or, or even if you think about it, like you're talking layoffs, right? Like people are going to lose their homes in these layoffs. So you have, you have a really, really crazy interest rate lock environment for all the people that locked really low interest rates in the last 28 months, right? Yeah. They lock these super crazy low rates and they're never going to be able to rent for what they owe for what they're paying on their mortgage. Equity is, an, is at an all time high, which again, puts people in a position where they don't need to sell. We're going to talk about that. And we forget the biggest lesson we learned in our last recession, which was in 2020, it was what did the government come out and do when we went through a recession and people couldn't make their mortgage payments when they weren't working? What did they do? Yeah, well, we went to forbearance. Yeah, we're gonna talk about like, that. We too. learned like the government didn't they didn't do these things yeah. and like come up with these tools and I know I'm probably getting ahead, but like doing all this stuff. Yeah, and then now they're like, well, the pandemic's over, so we're throwing all that out. Yeah, you know, right. like it just it they're once they have these tools in place, like the goal, like banks and and you're already starting to see a little bit of stress on like some balance sheets with banks and and things like that. Um, where they're like, they're not going back into the REO business. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So this next part of the video that I'm going to show the audience is where I think Patrick gets exposed the most. Ooh. This is where, yeah, pretty dramatic, <laughs> right? Honestly, man, I think this is where his team really, Steve, let him down. I mean, this guy, from my understanding is a hundred, 200, $300 million guy. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, I don't know how many thousands of people surround him. I don't know what the board of advisors look like how these people can let him go on YouTube and say what he is about to say, I, I, I'm shocked. Yeah. So, so let's watch it and then you can see what I'm talking about. Take a look at his active listings, which Dave Ramsey, who said, you know, this fear porn, all this stuff that he says, it's just not a big deal. Maybe a little bit. It's not going to happen. Nothing over five years, which by the way, five years, he may be right that nothing's really going to happen over five years, but we're talking today. Okay. We're talking today when, Hey, I want to buy a house right now. You may want to wait another year till you buy a house. Just watch this data here and you make a decision for yourself. So this is from realtor.com showing active listings and you'll see the different colors represent different years, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I want you to focus on 2022 all the way at the bottom, which is yellow. You'll see the active listings in January goes down. If it goes down, property value goes higher because there is less inventory for you to buy a house. For example, if I make an offer on a house here and I'm saying I wanna buy a house that's close to this uh, school and because I wanna send my kids to this private school and my realtor says, there's only two houses in this market with a swimming pool, I don't have a lot of options. There's only two homes. If there was 50, I can negotiate and say, if you don't give it to me at this price, I'll go over there. But if it's only two, they're gonna get 50 offers because 50 people are fighting to get that one house, the seller's in charge. But if listing was 50, the buyer is in charge. Make sense? So look at the numbers. January to February, inventory goes down. This is good for sellers. February to March, pretty much unchanged. Good for sellers. March to April, goes up a little bit better for buyers. Look at April to May, goes up. Look at May to June, goes up. 18.7%. Now, that's only two months. If this chart... The number to follow is this one. It's very important. It is. If the active listing keeps going higher. He's exactly right. We do need to look at this number. Now, hold on. Before we, we, yeah. we really just break this apart like crazy, I almost feel bad because it's so exposing uh, um, him in this video. I have the exact same graph pulled up that he had. Yeah. Now, I have the benefit of of making this video a couple months after he made his video. Yeah. But even if that wasn't the case, but however, let's look at that. So number one is if you look at all of the years, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 
they all went up and they all crested and they yeah. all went down. It's called home buying season. It I'm happens like, every year. I'm like, Patrick, how yeah. are you not addressing, how does your team not talk about seasonality? Yeah. They let you go up there and you talk about increase in listings and it does that every year since the history of time. That's not even the point. Yeah. That's not even the point. Dude, on the very video, on the graph he showed, you know what he didn't show? He says they're up 25% from the lowest inventory in the history of the world, 2021. What about all the numbers above it? Right. 17, 18, 19, 20. He doesn't say, look at this huge, massive gap. Right. Look what Realtor.com says. Despite this improvement in the number of homes actively for sale, as the chart clearly illustrates, active listings lag their pre-pandemic level and growth has stalled over the previous month. Yeah. If I'm Patrick, right. I'm firing people. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. He doesn't even, look, look, let me just make sure that the audience gets this. 17, 18, 19, 20, or 17, 18, 19. Then there's September, 2022. Listings are up 26% over 2021. That's right. the lowest inventory we've ever seen in the history of the world. Right. Of course they're up. Well, look at pre-pandemic levels. We're still way down. The right. point he was trying to make was that listings were so high. Right. But the evidence he showed was saying the exact opposite. opposite. I'm like, yeah. Patrick, are you kidding? Right. Yeah, that's it's it's weird, right? The the way the way that it comes out in in a lot of that, and and I always go back to like that's active listings, right? That doesn't count anything that's under contract, and it also. That, that includes, like, if you look at, like, the, the number of listings compared to completed homes that are on there, it's right. also a wild number. Like, builders are, ad, like, I, I said this last time. I always make this joke, and, and I make it to my wife all the time. Like, I see this beautiful house, and I get all excited to see the inside. I'm like, man, it's a stock photo. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a to-be-build, you know, and it's a listing. Well, let's hang out here for a second because you're right. So these are, the, what the, this is active listings, okay? And number right. one, they've already peaked, right? This right. is what they do every single year. Look at the graph. Every year they do the exact same thing. You got home buying season or home selling season. They go up and they go down. We're still way down from pre-pandemic. That's number one, okay? And Realtor.com talks about it, right? They say the total number of unsold homes, a metric that includes both active and listings in various right. stages of selling, that have not sold yet was only up 0.7% year over year from, oh, by the way, the lowest, the lowest inventory ever ever in the, the history plan. of the world. Yeah. Well, now watch total listing count. This is 1.1 million. You can look at the graph. We're both looking at it. We're all looking at it. We're not manip yeah. uh, 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 manipulating the data. Yeah. It's way down from right. pre pandemic. Inventory is way, way, way down. It's already crested. And then inventory is the driving factor of housing price crashes yeah. and we're going to talk about that later here in just a second now to your point this half of these are pending look at the pending yeah, 41 percent. Four hundred sixty-eight thousand of the 1 million are pending what does that mean that means there's only five hundred thousand homes for sale right well we're going to talk about that we're going to give the audience some context on that when in the crash i'll just say it right now yeah. So it's like 4 million homes 3.8 million or something at the peak which was insane how does patrick not talk about that right there's 500,000 homes available for sale right now. In a real crash, there was 4 million right. homes for sale. And the, and the part that never comes back up, and I know I sent it to you in a text and I, I ended up closing it out, but they said 30% of those, during that time, right? Those 4 million listings, yeah. like um, three per, or 30% of those were, uh, were exotic mortgages, were two to five year arms that had Interest only, negative amortiz amortization, amortization, whatever, am. Yeah. I, can't, I don't know why I can't get it. A nag, a nag am loan or a 40 go. year or a 40 year loan. Right. They were all 30% of that. So 1.2 million of those active homes had exotic, exotic mortgages on them, which was insane. Yeah, it's, it is absolutely insane. And so um, I, I couldn't believe that, again, his, his team just lets him go out there like that and and talks about that. Now, let's get into the worst one of the video, all right? So let me fast forward this and kind of see where we're at. This is so bad, Steve. I cannot believe, again, his team lets him do this. So let's share this and let's see where we're at. He talks about foreclosures, remember that? Yep. All right, so let's let's hear what he has to say. He, he doesn't get paid to do this. He's in the industry. It's worse than 2006. 
which the last one I'm going to share with you in this topic is foreclosures. This is insane. Why foreclosures this early? Aren't foreclosures are supposed to happen six months from now, maybe next year? What, what would you say is the increase in percentage of foreclosures that we have in 2022 compared to last year, same time? What do you think the increase is? 20% more foreclosures? 40% more foreclosures? 60% more foreclosures? Wow, it's not going to be 100%, right? You ready? We have 700% more foreclosures this year, same time than we did last year. Steve, <laughs> it, how is it possible that no one told Patrick, Patrick, last year you couldn't do a foreclosure? There yeah, was you, a couldn't collect, you couldn't even collect rent. You know, the government was not allowed to file, to, to do a foreclosure. Nobody tells him? Yeah. $500 million company. Hey, Patrick, you might want to, want to say that because there were no foreclosures last year. Because yeah. remember, they, so I'm like, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this from this guy that I have so much respect for. Did nobody tell this dude like what was actually happening? Right. So let's look at the report that he talks about in the video that he just, okay, here's what he sell. Foreclosures up 700%. So some, I don't know, maybe intern at his yeah. at, at value entertainment was like, Patrick, this is a really good point. Okay. Moratoriums, key points, prohibited new foreclosures from starting nearly two years ago. You could not do one. Yeah. So of course they're up 700%. And that's, that includes like tax foreclosures, HOA for, I mean, hold on. Tons this gets this even, stuff. this yeah. is even worse. Okay. This is even worse. So of course they're up 700%. Well, we have to give context. Without a right. comparison, you don't know. You don't have the context. Let's look at it. This is from Adam. The people where that that uh, report got the data from. Look at the foreclosure activity in 2022 compared to 2008, 2009, 2010 when we went through an actual crisis. Right. So for people listening, right now 164,000 foreclosures, okay? Remember, 2021, you couldn't do any. Yeah. So, of course, they're up. Yeah. Well, compare that to 2008, 1.3 million foreclosures. Right. 2009, 1.5 million. 2010, 1.6 million. We're at 160,000. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Well, it, it's the only crazy part is that nobody on his team, Patrick's team, shows him that. And they let him go on YouTube and just. I, I don't know how I don't know how that works in the big production scene, but you would think so, or at least go through it. I mean, it, it makes sense for the shock value of it, but it's just it's totally illogical. Well, the only way you you know? would, the only reason you're right, the only way you would do that is to is to to the to the fear porn is yeah. to get clicks, is to drive advertising. You know, in the beginning of the video, he had some big sponsor. And so, yeah, maybe he can go back to that sponsor and say, listen, I got a million views on this. The yeah. Next time we do something, I want more money, right? right? But I just don't understand that a guy like that comes out with claims right. when the data just doesn't support it. It's so it. contradictive and it's so accessible. Well, it's manipulating the data. Yeah. It's only showing this piece and then you don't show right. anything else. Right. In the 100%. exact same thing. Now, here was another thing. So in the entire video, he doesn't really talk that much about what drives a housing market crash, which is inventory, equity, and subprime mortgages. Right. And so I wanna, I wanna spend the rest of the time talking about that and giving people actual context so they can walk away from this video having a clear picture of what a housing market crash looks like yep. and what it doesn't. Right. And I wanna start off by showing Let's go back to um, showing this graph with realtor.com and let's go over here. Inventory. All right. So I'll share my screen. So this is, this is so interesting, right? So if we look back in 2008, we had upwards 2008, nine, 10, about 11 or 12 months worth of inventory. Okay? Yeah. This is when the housing market crashed because we had so many homes for sale. You could see in the orange, we had, it was a buyer's market. A neutral market is maybe six months worth of inventory. A seller's market, which is less than six months, which is what we have right now. Right. Look at the gap, right? It's not even close right. to, to where we were at, right? And so number of home uh, existing homes for sale. We reached almost 4 million homes for sale during the crash. So many homes. So many homes. <laughs> and now you got 500,000 right. to choose from. 
So that is so important for the audience to understand. Inventory is the driver of home prices. It is simply supply and demand. Yes, would you argue that uh, the demand has gone down because mortgage rates? Absolutely. 100%. But we talked about interest rates coming back down here in the fourth right. quarter and into Q1 of 2023, which will then bring demand back up with super, super low housing inventory, right. which would then suggest not the, the housing market not to crash. The number two thing I want to talk about is equity. You talked about yeah. this earlier in the show. Well, let's show the people the data, right? Because you can't just say things without showing data. Homeowner equity totaled $29 trillion or 70% of the total value of someone's home, meaning they have tons and tons of equity. You can see this on the graph that they're, we're, re we're reaching historical levels, right? If home prices decline, right. total homeowner equity could drop maybe from 70% to 67%. You still have so right. much equity. Now, let's look at this. In 2008, 11.7 million American households owed more on their mortgage than their home was worth. Right. Major discrepancy. Right. People don't owe very much on their properties. They have great equity positions. It's going to be very difficult for them to the walk away. The payments are super low. Exactly right. It's a and, it's night and day difference. Right. And you have to remember, and and you, you know, it's, it's, it's old, so we forget about it, but back back in 2008 2009 like leading up to that i mean we could do 110 percent financing everybody got a second mortgage and they took them at whatever rate they wanted because yeah. home values were going up and we're not worried about this that they were borrowing up to 100 percent of the value of their house where it's it just such a different lending environment today yeah. than what it was then so so know? go deeper on that because that's the last point is mortgage is subprime mortgages in 08 versus what what's happening now you write loans every day you know how difficult it is to get a yeah. mortgage versus every tom dick and harry getting a mortgage whether or not you had a job yeah i mean that was the major uh cause of the economic yeah. collapse and it, it goes back to that so that whole run up so so the way it worked is it was it was deceptive, right? So you'd have these, they talked about like mortgage tranches and we talked about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac buying mortgages. And and what would happen in Wall Street is these big banks like Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs and the Lehman Brothers and, and all these things would invest in at, like they would call it B paper. Basically, really they would they would package up loans. So you'd get some really good loans, some medium loans and some real dogs mm -hmm. and you know you right. mix them all together and you'd say we'll rate this a b sure and you're going to get such and such rate of return by investing on these things so once these large investments came in these we called them credit tranches where they were these packages where these big investment banks were buying these and providing massive returns to their investors well there's a huge appetite so there i can even remember working in the business where i could fully document somebody's income i could say this person does not need a stated income loan but because there's such an appetite for a stated income loan, you write it as a stated income loan and the bank that you work for pays you more money because they're making more money to say this is a stated income loan because now you've got a more secure loan. You have a loan that is a lot lower risk, but it's being packaged with these loans, which should help that tranche perform higher. And it's those days are just gone, right? I mean, there's I mean, look, there's some there's some products out there that, you know, are allowing three percent down that. That three percent down loan, though, you've got to you've got to meet a pretty strict guideline as far as debt to income ratios go. Well, how about having and, a job? Uh, yeah, you've got. Oh, I mean, I for mean, sure. I mean, that's I mean, like a given, when, right? When, yeah. When you and I met in the mortgage business, and I just want to uh, butt in for just a second, a little Budinsky. Yeah. Like you know the the Nina, right? The no yeah. income, no assets. And and when I started the mortgage business, I, I I said, wait a minute, they don't have to have a job. No, no, they don't have to work. They yeah. don't have to have any money. Nope, they don't have to have any money. No, they don't need any of that. We just give them money. Yeah, no problem. With like a 620 credit score, which a I'm 620 like, credit score, you can barely get approved today. So, I mean, that that is such night and day, night and day different than where we're at today. Yeah, 100%. Like you just can't even get a mortgage. It's yeah. like you're turning down people left and right, you know, that, yeah. that could fully document everything. Yep. And so the equity positions, yep. the, the, um, the inventory levels, the fact that the mortgage paper right now is just so much more, I don't know the word, maybe. Secure, it's just Secure. The cleaner paper. Cleaner paper, thank you. Yeah. These are all the driving forces of a housing crash that just, there's no evidence to support that any one of those three factors are, are at, at risk. Right, and and it should be said, and, and just to cover our tails, like there are stated income loans. There are, and it's not really stated income anymore, there's bank statement loans. Yeah. And, 
you just have to remember when, when we were doing these, you could, you would basically go to salary.com and figure out how much a right. landscaper made. And you put that in there and that's what their income was. And, and now that we call them non QM, right? Non qualified yeah. mortgages or like the new subprime, whatever you want to call it. You're talking 20 to 25% down in most cases. I mean, there's some sure. limited cases where you can put down less, whatever. Right. But the majority of them are 20 to 25% down. And then what they do is they take your bank statements for your business and they add up all your deposits that they think come from your business. Like there's no right. clear cut thing, right? Like they could be like, well, we're not going to use that $4,000 a month deposit because it came from Twitch. Well, I'm a makeup artist and I put my makeup yeah. on, on Twitch and Twitch pays me because right. I've got these followers I like, yeah, we're not real comfortable with something called Twitch. We're out on Twitch, right? You can tell I'm talking from experience, yeah. but what they do is they'll say, okay, so you've got $4,800 a month in deposits yeah. over the last 24 months, you average $4,800. We're going to whack that in half. So you now have $2,400 a month in income that you can use for your loan. And you can go up to 50% of that. So you're that, that stated income loan went from somebody thinking they probably may actually make like 75 or 80 grand a year to being able to use literally $15,000 a year in qualifiable income. That is today's bank statement loans. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an entirely to, different world, you completely know, completely different. And so, you know, I, I feel, I almost feel bad for making this video, but I felt compelled that we had to Yeah. just because, I mean, it's just so out of context, right? It was surprising. It was surprisingly out of context from him because I've never seen anything from him personally that I'm like not a huge fan of. Right. And this was one. I'm like, I cannot right. believe that my guy is doing this. Right. And I'm just like, the, the information shared in that video was just so, not only was out of context, but like the points he was making went against the argument. Right. Like you can't show active listings that's an argument for the people that think the housing market is not going to crash. And you right. make the point that it's going to cause the crash. Like, right. wait a minute, what you just showed us, we just told us just so that it was contradictive. It was contradictive. Yeah. And, and he kept doing that over and over again. I was just, I was blown away. I was too, but that's why we're here. Thank God for us. Yeah. You know, to, to reel it back in. Yeah. So anyway, so hopefully I he watches. Yeah. I'm going to send it to him. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what you guys think. Uh, I'm sure this is, Maybe you guys are mad that we we made this. I don't know. Uh, I just wanted people to have some more context and some truth. So let us know in the comments what you think. And uh, we'll see you guys real soon.